working in the plant trade here. Um, I do design, consulting. I worked at Descanso Gardens for a couple of years as their horticultural um, designer, which means I got to create four seasons of spring, summer, winter, and fall while I was there. Uh, it was a great experience, but as a nonprofit, it became very difficult to make a living in a nonprofit full time. So I left to start teaching, and it was a good decision because I get to do what I like to do is be in control of all of my design work and my consulting. So I made a great decision. But it all come, came from a good base at Descanso Gardens. Um, future classes coming up. So I have three samples up here in the front. This is not breakfast here or anything, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say. But we do have three types of soil. Clay, loamy, and a cactus mix. Most of us, including myself, um, have a clay soil, which means when it hardens, um, it becomes like concrete. Uh, when it's wet, it's very sticky, and uh, it holds a lot of moisture. So what happens, and what does that really mean, basically, if you have a plant in clay soil, the water is going to sit in the soil for a long period of time. Now, if you have drought-tolerant plants, that means that that plant's going to probably start having issues with having a lot of water in a wet soil in the root base. So, you may have to amend your soil. We'll talk about that shortly. So, in the big picture, clay soils are bad because they hold a lot of uh, moisture in the soil. They can become anaerobic over a period of time, which means there's no oxygen in the soil, and plants roots need oxygen to survive. And when it does dry like this, the fibrous roots that do all the uptake of water and nutrients break off in the soil. So these little clay particles like this break off. And doing so, it breaks off a lot of the smaller roots in the soil. So it's like concrete, breaks the roots off, not the best plant. So if you're spending your money on plants, I'd say also spend your money on amending your soil, getting it right at the soil level so everything that you put in your garden will do well. That means we want to, our goal is to accomplish a loamy soil which has a bit of a uh, compost in it. So here's how we do that. If you are, let's do a little um, design, a little drawing here, how we do amending our soil, what does that mean? So let's look at, um, let's say a side profile this is my garden here, and then we'll just say I'm excavating out. Let's say I'm going to put in a 24-inch box tree here. And that means, for those who aren't familiar with what 24-inch box tree, it's 24 by 24, so it's a pretty substantial size tree. Um, so what that means is if I'm putting in my 24-inch box tree into clay soil here, we'll say that's 24 inches. I'm still going to need some space to work with my soil that I'm going to add in here. And also, the bottom of that is very important. If we just leave it clay, all the water is going to sit there. So I would probably come down, and I'll explain how deep you want to go. <coughs> so if this is 24, it'd be 2 feet. I would come down 3 feet, dig a hole 3 feet in depth, and I would probably go three feet and wet. So now I have six inches on either side and a foot at the base here that I can fill in with. What I usually use is cactus mix because it has sand in it, it has perlite and small pebbles, which means that will help accelerate getting the soil away from the root ball of the, of the plant. You might even want to go, you can go a little bit wider if you wanted to it's up to you, it's up to your back on how much digging you want to do or the person that's doing it. But a 24 inch root ball would be 24 inches, so you want to leave yourself some space to backfill the sides and definitely give yourself a good foot of root growth down beneath the root ball. So you need a three foot hole by three foot wide. I would go a little bit wider just because. now. Your question might be, well, what happens when the roots grow out of that zone of new soil? Well, we'd be, we'd be probably composting on top of the soil, so eventually that will start to break down and get into the soil by the time these roots reach out to here. 
Um, that's important to know. So any kind of plant, if we're doing, this is a 15 gallon, this would be the next size down from a 24 inch box. So the same thing goes, let's take a look at this measurements of this. So this is um, about 17 inches in diameter. So I would dig the hole mm, 24 inches in width. That's still gonna give you at least two inches. I might even go a little bit more. 26, so you need a hole at least this wide because that's going to be the center of your plant. It gives you this maybe two to three inches of good soil to put underneath this. The other option you can do is excavate all of that soil out of here, which is a, this is a big project too, is take all this soil out of here, just discard it somewhere in the garden, or hang on to some of it, and I'll show you what you can do with that. And then just fill this with cactus mix, put your tree in, and you can call it a day. That soil that we excavated here could be used around the tree to build a berm, which would be like a little donut-shaped berm around the base of the tree that will hold this, the water. So when you water this in, the water doesn't run off here but yet this little soil berm you built around it lets the water go right into the root ball of the plant. Does that make sense? And I usually recommend when you're planting for the first time uh, a tree that comes from a nursery that was probably watered three or four times a week uh, that when you... So this is my plant here and this is that berm that we built around here that you fill it once, let the water drain in Refill it again, let the water drain down, and then I always do it three times, let the water drain in. So once that basin fills up, just let the water drain down and then fill it two to three times, especially this time of year. It's very hot. It also depends on the plant. If you know that it's a Palo Verde or a plant that's uh, you've done some research and you know that it's going to do well in very dry conditions, maybe you only need to do this about every two to three weeks. Okay. But that's something you'll need to do at least. Depends on the weather. It depends on where you live, too. Let's see a question back there. Any questions? No? Okay. You don't compact the soil, do um, No. What you would do once once you've dug in your, your, your plant is in the ground here, okay? I usually take the shovel, the end of my shovel, and then I just make sure all the air pockets are out of this, okay? So, yes, you want to pack the soil in. You can use your foot but you can't get your foot all the way down to three feet, so you may have to use something like the end of your shovel and take your water hose at the same time as you're packing in, water it in so that soil all comes down to here. It's when you have pockets of air that end up becoming trapped in your soil that could be a problem, especially if you've got a soil, let's say, um, well, if you're amending it with soil, I wouldn't worry, but uh, I would just try, you, the idea is to get rid of those air pockets. You don't want to breed bacteria in there, okay? And that can happen sometimes whenever you're cutting roots or you're, say you've sliced the root up when you're digging it in, those are now open wound roots, and so you don't want to have air pockets where it can breed bacteria. It probably is being a little more on the safe side. That doesn't always happen. Okay, any questions? Can I ask one? Yeah, you can buy it anywhere, and they sell it here. Um, I find that Home Depot cactus mix is misleading. Um, I've bought it from them before, uh, and only to take it home and realize that it's mostly compost, which is the complete opposite. Compost is like a sponge; it's going to hold a lot of moisture. If I'm planting succulents or drought-tolerant ornamental grasses or a cactus, I want to get the water away from the roots of the plant. So. If you feel this, you can feel the grit in this. It's like coffee grounds. When you blend your or you brew your coffee, you don't want the water sitting in the grounds because it becomes bitter. And the, the soil example, you want the water to percolate through. There's a little bit of compost in here, enough to hold moisture, but there's a lot of grit, sand, and perlite sometimes to help get most of the water away from the roots. So don't get your your cactus mix at home, do you? You can. Sometimes there's a, there's a product that they have I don't remember the name, but you can um, look at it and you can tell. Sometimes there's someone who may have ripped a hole in the side of the bag or there might be a tear. I just look before I buy because sometimes they fill them with compost 
and it's not what they say they're selling. And I've mentioned that to them at, the, at their at the stores before, that they're selling a compost mix, not really a cactus mix. This here is the best. Um, you can look around and buy other places too, but um, I always just buy a bag. Everything I plant, even containers, I use cactus mix, especially in containers because the drainage space is usually very small. Even though they can drill more holes here for you, you still are only going to have three or four holes for the water to get out. So if you're using a compost soil, this is going to stay pretty wet in here for a long period of time. If you use cactus mix and you've got extra drainage holes, it's going to allow the water to get quicker down to the bottom here so you don't have to worry about your plants sitting in wet soil again. Okay, yes? Where did you say you buy it? What's that? I buy it here. I buy it right here at this at Jackalo. Yes, almost every garden center sells it, but I like the quality of it here because it has a great grit texture to it, uh, and I can you can t you can feel the difference. And next maybe the next class I'll bring in a Home Depot sample and show you the huge difference and how much compost they have in their cactus mix. Okay, any other questions for now? Alrighty. Um, so we know that your clay soil is going to hold moisture. Now, if you have a very sandy soil, it's going to be the completely opposite. The soils that are sandy, typically you'll see um, your plants need more nutrition because water percolates through the, soil, the sand quicker. Also, the nutrients go in, out as the soil as well. So that means on your sandy soils, you would need to amend with compost. You can buy a bag of compost. You can make it yourself. If you're making compost at home, it can take anywhere between three to four months to make it. So I don't know how much time you have. It's always good to have good homemade compost. So I say buy a bag of compost, mix it with your sand, because again, you want to retain moisture in sandy soils and clay soils. You want to get the moisture out. There'll be a quiz on that question later. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay, so that's important to know. Um, Let's talk about, we talked a little bit about plant sizes, so I'm probably jumping around a little bit, but let me just mention a couple things about plant sizes. So I couldn't bring in a 24 inch box tree, but they're typically, well they are 24 by 24. If you're looking for larger sizes, 36 inch box would be 36 inches, but look at the size of the root ball, you would have to take, that's 36 width. Planting a tree, you're going to need to go about 40 six would be 10 inches so it's five inches on either side of that and then you've got 36 46 inches in depth so it's a large size tree to plant um hire someone to do that um so that's your 36 24s and your 15 gallons on all plants i recommend breaking up the root ball of your plants because here's what can happen let's see if this guy needs to be yeah, it's not so. Even on these one gallons here, I you see what happens is these really fine roots here are the ones that do all the absorption of water and nutrients. Um, these are kind of more of a uh, scaffolding or more of a support system, although grasses don't really need it. In trees, you'll see these large roots trying to that support the tree. It's the fibrous roots that we want to break up. Otherwise, this becomes a big mat. And if I just put it in the ground like this. Chances are, if it's more of a root-bound plant, the roots would continue to grow around in a circle and not be healthy and grow out of way. So I would just break apart like this. All you have to do. So now we're breaking that circle of plant roots going around, and we plant that into the ground, and the roots now will grow away from the plant, which is what you want. Um, always plant your plants as deep as the root ball itself. You don't want to get any deeper because then you're holding a lot of moisture up here and this starts to uh, ruin and, and rot your plant. So keep your soil at the original soil line. If you're mulching, which I recommend because it keeps the, water, the soil from drying out, keep your mulch very thin here and out here you can go two to three inches in depth. It helps keep the weeds from growing up, but you don't really have to worry about it so much here. So just a thin coat of mulch here. You don't want to put mulch big banked up to your plants here. Okay, and this is a one gallon Carex, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes here. These are great ornamental grasses, by the way. Okay, so, um, 
let's see. And also that was a 15 gallon, and then this is five gallons, and then that's a one gallon size, but as you don't know, and then they make flats. Flats are where you have a approximately 30, 20 to 30 plantlets, small plants in here that you break apart and you can plant them. These typically run 12 to $18 a flat depending on the plant, but you get a lot of small plants. If you have patience and a lower budget, which I've done before, you just break apart the plants and you install them into the ground. Make sure your soil is amended though. If it's clay soil, you definitely want to amend that soil. So these are your flats. This is your five gallon here. Again, if you're planting that, this is approximately, I think, 11 inches in diameter. It is. So I would uh, dig the hole probably 18 inches in width. That gives me a couple of inches on either side to fill with the backfill of cactus mix and a good three to four inches at the bottom. Okay? Five gallons, one gallons, and then 15s. If you're planting a hedge of 15 gallons, um, depending on the plant, this is the center of my plant right here, 15 gallon, how far apart would I plant these? It depends on what you're planting. If you're doing um, bamboo, um, make sure it's the clumping bamboo, not the running bamboo, because people on both sides of your house or across the street will defriend you. Um, <laughs> Oh, they might not, sure. Uh, but this is where the three, three feet is usually the number I would recommend. If you have a hundred feet that you need to cover a linear space, okay, who's good at math? Heads up. And so I want to plant a 15 gallon, one of these, say podocarpus and that's a pretty good hedge plant to put in i would not do ficus i would not do the uh, the running bamboo um for a hedge podocarpus and uh, ligustrum anyone looking to do a privacy hedge or wants a wall of green in their property either one of those podocarpus ligustrum uh eugenias are good only if it's away from the house or the pool or the driveway. They have a lot of seeds, so you're feeding the birds. It's great, but you also end up getting them on your car and in your pool. What about thrip on Eugenia today? Um, you'll get it on anything. Uh, it's 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 everywhere. Thrip like is basically everywhere. Pardon me? It seems like it seems to be worse than Eugenia. You'll have to do, if you see thrip, which is an insect that the, the leaves start to pucker up and get deformed, you would need to do a root drench. I would let the plant take it up through the roots. Otherwise, you'll be spraying forever. And also, thrip is seasonal. Whenever there's new growth coming on your plant, you're going to get the thrip because they lay the eggs inside the leaf tissue. So, what happens? It's a moth that lays its eggs inside the tissue of the leaf. The new growth, because it's softer and easier for the eggs, the the the, the thrips to move around inside the leaf. If you're, um, you'll see it on citrus a lot. So you would need to do either a, um, a spray or systemic, but check with your citrus if you're harvesting it for food, on um, whether the directions will tell you whether, if you can use that on your fruit trees. So you put it on the, the drip, you put it on the, in the ground in the spring? When it, whenever there's new growth. Because you go out today, there's no thrip on your new growth. Tomorrow, there may be thrip, you never know. So if you have a problem with thrip, um, it will be uh, on the new growth. And I'm going to see if there's any kind of a picture in here that we can see on citrus thrip. I'm sure there How is. Are you spelling? T H R I P. Okay. And I know they do. Let me just, for those who don't know this insect, and it can affect anything with new growth. Um, some plants are more susceptible than others. Thrip. <laughs> They're very tiny insects, and they burrow. Here. So it's a very small insect. You can, you can barely see them when they're that young. But they definitely can do a huge problem on your plants. So it also pays to, you know, if you're investing a lot of money into a, a ficus hedge or, a, excuse me, a hedge of screening, to maybe at least once a week take a walk through your garden and see what's going on. Uh, because sure enough, as soon as you don't, you look up and you see that you have something going on and it could wipe out your entire investment here. So 
I would plant 15 gallons every three feet. Three into 100 gives me... Six or seven. How much? Six or seven. Six or seven, so we'll say seven. I like it. If you want a denser hedge, you can plant a little closer. So you just uh, multiply seven times the price, and there's the price of your hedge or screening. However, those 15 gallons have to be dug a little bit deeper. Is this making sense for you? Because you want to make sure that you get the good soil in there. All right? This linear footage, this will give you an idea of what that budget's going to cost. If you're breaking your yard into say segments or phases i want to get the screening hedge up first i always recommend do the backyard first the front yard is going to be your your area where you're going to be traipsing through you don't want to design your front yard and then have to go do the backyard so start in the back if you're designing both parts of your project get the back done first large material trees shrubs hedges all that out of the way first and then you can work on your more ephemerals and your smaller uh, scale plants okay Let's go to, also you'll need to ask yourself a couple questions in the beginning of this design. We're going to go into design now. Is what are your, the purpose of your, your design? Are you looking to um, accent, create a focal point, mass, planting, repeat, or specimens? Um, so again, we already decided we need a screening hedge here. What, what is my plant what choice going to be? The cost? How many? Also, what is the maturity? What is this going to look like? How much maintenance is going to be involved with this? If you did ficus, well, know there's a lot of maintenance involved in ficus. You want to keep the ficus trimmed. For one reason, you don't want to let them get out of control is that the roots can be invasive. Podocarpus is a slower grower. Ligustrum don't typically get above 12 to 15 feet maximum. And then your Eugenias can become monster trees, so those have to be trimmed at least yearly. So looking at that investment as well, you can add that into the equation. If you're not going to trim it yourself, is your gardener going to do it? Or are you going to have to hire someone? If you let them go for three, four, five, ten years, you'll have a huge problem on your hands because then you've got to get someone in with the ladders to get in there and trim those up. So start with your, knowing your plant choices too. If you've got an idea of what you want to plant, look at the maturity, how big it's going to be, and what the maintenance is going to bring you down the road. Okay. Um, let's, in the design of this, uh, it's a good idea to start with, I always, when I do a client's design, I just sort of do it on paper like this. You don't have to be quite so elaborate, but for me, I need to know the square footage. I know where all the stairs, the walkways are. So now I can just use each of these places as a template to give me an idea of what's going to go in here. If the house is here, you know, I can't put anything really heavy and dense up close to the house. So if you can start out with a sketch or something on paper, you want to include the house, the walkways, power lines, existing walls, um, sidewalks, driveways, things that are not going to change. Perhaps you're going to move the walkway from the straight line from the sidewalk to the front door, that's going to come out of the equation, which will give you a little more space to work with. But get it on paper, and then you can sit down after you've measured everything out and figure out what the square footage is going to be. So on this one, for example, let's look at this here. And what that means for us here. Um, I have a sidewalk swale. Most of us have a parkway out in front of our house. The city says, you're responsible. We say, no, you're responsible. So there's this back and forth. I guess it depends on where you live. But I just go ahead and take responsibility. Um, this is going to be 4 feet in width by 27 feet in length. So I would multiply that and gives me my linear or my total square footage. Unless someone can do it fast. I wasn't mad this morning. Who won that? Who won? Who wins? Of course. You tied. You tied. So 108. So it's 108 square feet. So what that means, if I'm going to mulch this, or if I'm going to do gravel, or if I'm going to do flagstone, although I don't think you can do flagstone on the parkway, but just, just to give you an idea, I would make a phone call or just know that I need 100, 108 square feet of mulch. 
mulch is usually two to three inches in depth, okay? That really gives your soil a chance to stay, keep from drying out too quickly, and also keep the weeds from coming up. Although they will eventually come up. I don't use weed block anymore. I used to you know, talk about using weed block. Um, weed block sterilizes the soil. Organic matter can't get into the soil. And if I decide later I want to change it out to make this an organic garden, I've got to start from scratch because the soil is completely void of earthworms and uh, organic matter and microbial activity, which is important to use in a vegetable or a uh, ornamental garden. So I don't do weed block, I just do extra mulch. So in this area here, I already know I need 108 square feet of mulch. And then I have this flower bed here. It's kind of a T sh or L shaped, and it is 27 by 25 by seven. All right, and here's the smart one now. <laughs> I am 27 times 25 times. Wow, okay, did I do that right? <laughs> Gotta get the calculator right. It's a lot of square footage there. I think, that, I think that's right. So, yep, that's 4,700 square feet. Okay, so if I'm doing mulch, which is the cheapest ground cover, if you're just covering all your plant material, you need 4,700 square feet of mulch. So these numbers sort of give you an idea of what you need to buy in the hardscape. If you're doing plant design, then we can talk about where that's, what size plants you need and how close in, uh, you're going to be planting your plants. So let's go with, let's do the parkway here. Since that's usually the first thing we see. So trees on the parkway, no magnolias, no ficus, no uh, banyans, liquid ambers. Um, Why no magnolias? Roots can be really bad and invasive. It's a, they're very messy trees. Leaf, leaf drop constantly. In Culver City, mm -hmm. I have a client that has magnolias. The whole tree, the street is lined in magnolias and all the sidewalks. They've been in the ground 20 plus years, but I stay away from the trees that are going to give you a big issue with that. The so. city of Beverly Hills replaced all their um, Ficus Benjamino with magnolias on. The Don't know who is sitting on the council of with the city. Unfortunately, <laughs> well, no, they have they have a pretty active right. Um, I just uh, don't. Urban forest. Yeah, there. I just the, yeah. Beverly Hills is great. Some of those streets are awesome, but they also have they can afford to. They're probably the first sidewalks to be replaced in Los well, the Angeles. Re the reason they took out the the ficus was not even the it's bad if they were tearing up the Water. sidewalks. Yeah, they were. This is before the draft. They were utilizing. They were 30% of the urban forest, and they were using, utilizing like 70% of the tree cutting. Right. There are so many trees that we can plant in the landscape besides the traditional ones that we see that per pose a problem. They're, magnolias are not native to California. Uh, they do require a lot more water and care. Uh, they do have an issue with sidewalks, depending on how mature the plants are. There's a lot of trees that we can use in the landscaping that does not require a lot of water. They can bring in local pollinators to the neighborhoods, butterflies and, um, and uh, hummingbirds. So of that, I would probably, looking at a four foot wide sidewalk with 27 inches, I would probably do something that's going to be more of a shoestring acacia. I just saw, I think someone got this one right in Silver Lake. They planted shoestring acacias on Sunset Boulevard, which is a drought tolerant tree. It has a beautiful yellow flower in the springtime, uh, similar to the um, Palo Verdes. Um, we could do um, the Arbutus. Those are three that I can think of off the top of my head that don't get huge, that are not invasive with roots on the sidewalks or uh, if you're planting them up near your house. And they also have, uh, they're drought tolerant and they have really great flowers on them as well for pollinators. So I kind of plant knowing that I want to encourage activity pollinators into my garden and then I know that it may not be exactly from California but maybe from the Mediterranean climate, maybe from 
uh, parts of the world that have a similar climate to California, and there's a huge uh, list of plants that don't get used in the landscaping because people go, well, everybody else has liquid ambers, so we're going to keep with the same liquid ambers. Um, I just don't plant those. So know that you know your plant at maturity because if this shoestring acacia got to be say 100 feet in height, then you had a one-story house and the roots became invasive. I believe this house was sitting close in here. I would plant my trees at least 15 feet away, 15 or 20 feet away from the house, depending on the tree you're planting. You don't want to have to end up pruning the tree away from the house. It be hat racked or destroyed because um, someone hired someone to come in because it was too close to the house. So plant 20 feet away, more out towards the center of your house. Again, knowing how your tree is going to mature in the landscaping, if it's going to be a massive tree like a redwood on a one-story house, it will look kind of funny when you've got your house here and you've got the redwoods here, if they ever survive to be that, that tall. And redwoods, um, when I worked at Descanso, there's a couple of redwoods that are planted in the Camellia Garden. In the Camellia Garden, the redwoods look great, but if you go out towards the other side of the garden, the redwoods look really bad because there's a little, there's a microclimate in the camellia gardens where it's always humid, it's cooler, there's more moisture. The redwoods do better in Northern California and Oregon. Um, they can grow here, but do they look their best? No, they don't always look their best. So again, a little research on your trees and choose them wisely and plant them in your landscaping. Note, when you go and do your research, besides looking at the beautiful flowers and the foliage it gives you, you can look at the mature height and width of your tree. The uh, Balhenia city plants a lot of the Hong Kong orchids uh, they have in Hollywood. Beautiful uh, pink flowering trees that are actually going into bloom now because of all this extra heat we've had. But they don't typically get wide. It's, we call those patio trees. They're probably maybe 12 to 13, 14 feet in width by about 16 feet in height. So it's a manageable tree in the landscaping. You don't need a lot of pruning or trimming on that. Um, but by knowing that, we can plant that accordingly away from your house, knowing that it only gets to be 15 feet in wet. Bahenia, B-A-H-U-N-I-A, Hong Kong orchid. It's a beautiful orchid flower on it. There's a white variety, pink and a purple. There's also another tree I call a patio tree. It's called Tababuya, T-A-B-E-B-U-I-A. It's another pink tree that's going into bloom now. It's a smaller trumpet-shaped flower. So it looks almost like um, the mandevilla flowers. Anyone familiar with mandevilla alamandas? It has a, a deep throat uh, uh, trumpet shout up flower shape to it. So anyway, there is a, an, an idea where you need to start with your design. Um, first of all, demo the landscaping, whatever's coming out, if it's plant's been there forever, it's diseased, it's been pruned and butchered, whatever, and it's coming out, sidewalks coming out, you want to get all the hardscaping that's coming out first. So the idea is that you're starting with a, either a clean slate or a quasi-clean slate. So the order of operations would be demo, out, with whatever you're not using. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this before, I'll say it again, if you have trees that look like they might need trimming, removing, or the disease, I would hire a certified arborist to come out and make those um, decisions along with you based on what you know your goal is. If you're keeping in the liquid amber here and you're containing its growth by pruning it once a year, maybe you're going to keep that in the landscaping. But I would say before you really get anything big out of the property, just look at it and find out if you need to pull a permit too. Some cities require permits on tree removal, especially can't do oaks unless it's something to do with power lines and problem, problems of that sort. You can't take out uh, <coughs> Cedrus deodora. Uh, Cedrus deodoras are in, usually in Glendale and in La Cunada. 
you have to pull a permit if those are being removed. So demo is what's coming out of your landscaping, and that includes the hardscape, if you're taking out old sidewalks, pathways, um, trees, shrubs, facade. Even if you're just removing part of it, go ahead and take out the, the area that you're taking out that you're going to put into your design the sod. Uh, next is the design, which means what we're doing now, laying out on paper so I know where my sidewalk is now going to go, the square footage. Um, if I need to amend that soil, which chances are you will, you might be able to buy your soil in bulk as opposed to bagged cactus mix. It can be very costly. If you're redoing 4,800 square feet of garden and you want to do amending your soil, you may have to buy it in bulk. Yes, Judy? Um, well, you're saying 4,800 square feet. Is that when you buy your, your uh, amendment, whatever you're using, you're talking three inches. Yeah, you probably, I always order more because chances are I'm going to use it somewhere else in the landscaping, if not in containers, maybe in the back. And I also have these other areas here. And I would always ask the people I was speaking with on the phone saying, hey, I've got three sections of my yard. One is 4,800 square feet. One is linear at 108. And so that gives me this number, I want to go three to four inches in, in depth, and I'm not planting any huge trees. Would how much of that tops of that cactus mix would I need? That's the kind of numbers they're going to need from you. So those square footage helps them, and you decide on how much of that you need. And the same with gravel, the same with mulch, the same with river rock, etc. Demo design, and then the install phase is basically just that. And what that means is, uh, let's see here, spacing of your plants. Let's do, let me wipe this out here. So I'm going to use this area here. Uh, well, we'll use this one. It's an easier number, 108 square feet. Okay, so I'm going to part, I'm going to plant this parkway here. And my idea is to do something that's not going to get really wide, so I have to end up trimming it because it's only going to be four feet in width. So my plant choice is I'd have to go do my research on plants that are not going to get much wider than four feet. Now that doesn't give me a huge options if I'm talking about shrubs, but that's four feet right. Oh, there we go. That's four feet right there. So if I'm doing salvias, and I like salvias because they attract hummingbirds and butterflies, I would look for a salvia that did not get wider than four feet. You don't want to end up having to chop your salvias down to two or three feet on either side. Um, so if your goal is to plant salvias or a shrub plant, I would keep the plant width under four feet. And if you can't find anything like that, you can start doing things like succulents, um, also cactus, things of that sort. The tree you're going to plant, let's just plant our tree. I'm going to plant it off center right here. So that leaves me, I'm going to say 12 feet here. Let's just estimate and that would give me the other 18 feet here. So I'm going to put in my 15 gallon tree and then I'm going to do one gallons because I don't have a huge budget let's just say that so I have one gallons and we're gonna call this salvia um, let's call it salvia clevelandii which is a really favorite salvia of mine and in a one gallon it's only seven inches wide so I dig my hole 11 inches in diameter when this is big it's probably gone pretty much take up the entire four foot width of that sidewalk It'll still look great because I don't have to prune it so much, or if any, because it does typically get out about four feet in width. So I would plant this here. Now if I have 12 feet between my tree and the sidewalk, if that gets four feet, how many of those would I be able to plant? Um, maybe two. So it gives me eight feet. I don't want it up underneath the tree here where it starts to you know, impede the growth of either one. So I would give myself 
another four feet. Does that make sense? Away from the center of the tree. Two salvias, 15 gallon tree here, and now I've got 18 feet to work with here. So I'm trying to figure out what my budget is on one gallons. I want to break it up, maybe we want to add in some large rocks right about here. A couple of large boulders, not too big because there are issues with giant boulders on the sidewalks. But I like to sort of make this look a little more natural because over here I'm probably going to do some rocks and boulders too. And I want it to sort of all kind of flow together. So my smaller scale plant material would be here. And then as I cross the sidewalk, the scale would go up. I can start planting a little bit larger plant material that grows up a little higher. Maybe I'm going to repeat a salvia here. I like to plant in odd numbers, threes, fives, and sevens. So I'm going to do three salvia lucanta, and I'm going to call that mm, Palo Verde. Beautiful yellow offsets the purple of these flowers, so you've got a complementary or contrast in color purple and yellow, and I'm just pulling plants out of my head here, this is just an on-the-spot design. Um, Lantana gets wide, uh, but it's a ground cover, and it, if, you, if you train it, it stays pretty much about a foot and a half to two feet in height, but <laughs> Lantana trails, it gets really wide, so if you're, if you're in the garden, you'll be able to con control that growth. Um, there's yellow, there's purple, there's white. If I'm using yellow and purple, I'm going to do, let's just do yellow. I'm going to plant, um, let's say, a flat. Instead of one gallon, so I'm going to go to flats. So I've got 25 plants here for about $18, so it's about a dollar a plant. And they're easy to plant. I don't have any digging to do except with a trowel instead of a big shovel. So I'm going to plant my lantanas at the base here. So sort of the, the object is this sort of goes down like this, looking at it obviously from a bird's eye point of view. So I plant these little plantlets, which are no bigger than this, about let's say 12 inches apart, so about a foot apart. And if I've got 24 of those, I have a lot to cover that will get me down to about here. The idea is it to spread and cover the ground here. And then if I wanted, I could do, let's just call this another four feet. Am I okay with you guys? Make, making sense? Kind of giving you an idea of vision? Yes? Okay. Um, I'm going to plant a 15 gallon Ceanothus. There's about four types of Ceanothus that I like to use because they don't get huge. There is a ground cover Ceanothus that I could replace the lantana with. It's called Yankee Point. Beautiful cobalt blue flowers this time of year. Otherwise it's a green carpet of leaves. Um, I'm going to do, I think I'll do the Joyce Culture Ceanothus. The Ray Hartman gets a little large. But again, it has a beautiful blue, cobalt blue flowers. It's a shrub that you can train it to about five to six feet in height by five to six feet in width. So it becomes this mass of blue flowers. So I have this uh, cobalt blue ceanothus, yellow lantana. I have the three um, Clevelandii, a couple boulders, and then I have a yellow acacia or palo verde. Done. Mulched. Yes. Do those require a lot of water? Irrigation, yes. You will need to run your irrigation underneath your sidewalk. Your gardener or your, your contractor will have to do that. So each of these would be on a, this would all be on a drip line. Irrigation, good question. So that would all be done. It will be set up before you plant so that you've got your piping underneath your sidewalk. And then once your plants are planted, you can attach your drip line to go around your plants like so. It gets woven into the landscaping. And then after your plants are in, you can mulch over this. And the water actually stays beneath the mulch, not on top of the mulch. Because then the mulch soaks up all your water. So you keep it below the mulch. And then this part of your project is done. You figured out what you need in plants based on just a, a generic 
idea. So that flower bin may have cost you only maybe $500 at most. Throwing that out there with the labor included, a couple boulders. If you really wanted to, um, that's probably, that's fine. That's what I, I would do something like that. I don't want to add any more plants to that. These salvia clevelandii, knowing the size of your plant and maturity is really important. And then you can repeat this in the design here and here so that it all flows across the property together. What, you, what I think works better on a smaller scale home like this one is repeating the plant material. We only have one, two, three, I have four types of plants here, the salvia, the tree, the lantana, and the ceanothus. We could repeat that and we could still add a few other things in here as well. But by keeping the textures and the colors across the property, it makes the house look bigger, not so busy. You don't have a ton of maintenance to do. Um, it's an idea for design work. Any other questions? Yes. Could you like talk a little bit about um, parkway ground cover that's really drought resistant and along the same lines, UCLA just put in across from the law, law school a whole area of drought resistant plants. They put in a, a lot of copper lines and I mean it was a gigantically expensive project. They had a nice budget, a nice time. Exactly. Huh? But I, and it looks great too now, but in thinking practically for, for example, for rental property where I've got a big parkway mm -hmm. and the grass is just eating, the water right. is just getting gargantuan. Are there some practical solutions? Yeah, and also you, so they just finished this project recently that you're talking? UCLA is about two years now. Okay, so how's it look two years later? Beautiful. Okay, so they have a good maintenance crew who takes care of that because that speaks for the, the university. They have to have that. It's a visual impact. Most of us, you know, you know, we don't want to end up spending tons of money on a specialist or a gardener. Most of our gardeners just blow leaves and that's about it. And we don't want to have to spend our time going out doing that detailing, especially if you're having a rental property. So that being said, you have to research the, the traffic area. Like, is there going to be someone parking here? So when they step out onto your sidewalk or onto your parkway, are they stepping into your five, you know, your salvias here? Or are you allowing maybe these little walkways, flagstone walkways, to get you to the sidewalk? And so that's an option too. You can do uh, either, I, I will get to your, I'm going to just give you a couple of options here. So you can do flagstone, gravel. Um, there's a ground cover called Damandia that does well in high foot traffic. It comes in flats generally, and it's a very, very flat gray green yeah. carpet with a yellow flower. It's, so it's hard to get started. It's right? hard to get started. So you gotta maybe rope off an area and uh, until it, it gets taken in. Um, mulch is another one. Um, as far as foot traffic and planting, that's gonna be your best choice. Anything else can take moderate traffic, but people are, you know, if it's a neighborhood where people are just going to open their car door and step out, I don't think I would invest a lot of money in this plant design here. I would stay more into gravel with maybe a few succulents or maybe a few, you know, blooming flowers like the uh, salvia interspersed in areas where you know Obviously, you hope someone's going to see that when they open the door and not step out onto it. When you, the different succulents that, that you put in, uh, the smaller cactus, even one or five gallon cactuses, do they, can they just be hand watered? Yes. Yes. If it's this time of year, well, this time of year is not applicable because we should be having cooler weather and rain, <laughs> but we haven't. So the idea is this is the time of year to plant because we have. March and April and the beginning of May before it gets hot. <laughs> that sounds really weird to say because it's only nine. So yes, October, November, December, January, February, March. So with the first six, that six months is the best time to plant. So now we're getting sort of towards the end of our season here. And so I would say uh, now's a good time to plant because you can rely on the weather to water the plants for you. So yes, you can hand water 
your succulents, so you may not need to run irrigation lines. So, depending on what you plant, there's um, agave. This has no thorns on it. Okay, this is the agave attenuata. You see them everywhere. Here's a good secret. You may already know that. If you see some of the big clump of agaves, you just go over and you can saw them off. Let them dry out for a couple of days. You know, where you cut that off, it's got to harden off and form a callus. And then you just go over there, dig a hole, and you stick it in the ground. New plant. Free, if your neighbor's nice, then yeah, take all you want. Otherwise, you'll spend, on a five-gallon agave, you could spend up to $45, depending on where you shop. So, if you know of a place, you know someone's going to say, yeah, please take all the cuttings you want. Then you cut them, let them harden off. Three, four, three, three days is generally good and then you just plant them in the ground. However, here's a word of caution. If all these agaves were growing in the shade that you just cut and you're gonna plant them in full sun, guess what's gonna happen? All these leaves are going to sunburn really bad. So the plant's gonna look like it's dying, which it really probably is. But what will happen if it starts to form roots, the new leaves that are coming out will be what we call sun leaves. They've been acclimatized to that new environment. So if you know that your plants are all coming from that shaded area of your garden and you're going to plant them in the front and they're whatever, you're going to have an issue with the plant looking bad until it acclimatizes to that new soil or sun. Okay? So agave tenjuatas can be planted there. And you can do the demandia as a ground cover, but look really great because you still got that gray green color. And you just do clumps. Of the agave. Is you that have the green do... agave or is that the yellow and green agave? I'm sure they have one here somewhere. Uh, it looks like that one there, but that's not the agave. I mean, that's an agave. That's more, it's called the uh, octopus agave. But it has a big fleshy leaf, white, kind of a grayish green like that one there. What about uh, the yellow green one? With the thorns? Yeah. Uh, that gets about 10 feet wide. Yeah. If you have a four foot parkway, I mean, a four foot walkway, Someone's either going to get free acupuncture or you're going to have to shear up the agaves and that looks really bad when you do that to that plant. You're looking for trouble. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. just, I mean, you can snip the tips off, but they grow really fast. Okay? Yes? You mentioned a yellow acacia and then another plant, Palo. Palo Verde, P-A-L-O-V-E-R-D-E. The one I recommend is the Desert Museum cultivar. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have thorns on it. Nasty thorns, I should say, like some of the other ones. The uh, Desert Museum is also not as big a tree. So, on your parkways, those are good questions, valid. So, is it foot traffic? How much money am I going to waste? Maybe you do some gravel, a couple of those agaves that the neighborhood starts, you know. Well, there were some agaves here last week. What happened to them? Uh, agaves. Gravel, damandia, maybe a couple of stones, done. And then as you get into your property, you can really accentuate more with that. And yes, you can hand water. Those agaves, once they get established, you probably don't have to water at all. The demandia, you will have to water by hand. Is that like DG? Is that like DG? DG is decomposed granite. It's, okay. it's just like hardened clay soil. Yeah. On another note, for cactus in, in long-standing 10-year-old cactus, uh, that are getting yellow, is that lack of minerals or, or too, too little water? They're, are they in pots or in the ground? Pots. Pots, and they're turning yellow? Yeah. Hmm. Could be too much water. Depends on what the bottom looks like. Is there holes in the bottom? Uh, are the roots growing out of the holes? Uh, how long has it been in the pot? Over 10 years. Okay, so yeah, it has no way of getting food. It's not, it can't go out and get it itself, so it's going to have to get a liquid fertilizer and just use a liquid fertilizer the next time you water and cut back on the watering also if it's been in the pot that many years it probably has no soil it's probably all roots mm -hmm. and the soil is probably leached out and any kind of nutrients that were ever in there is gone years ago so this plant is just existing on photosynthesis its own sugars but it needs a nutritional soil or it needs to be in a bigger pot Again, if this is a plant, this is a perfect pot size because now I can add more soil and I'm giving it another four years of growing before I gotta repot it again. Make sense on that? Yeah. Okay. Did I see a hand? No?